Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews is one of the most important books in all of the New Testament. It is perhaps, along with the book of Galatians, the book of the New Testament that churches need to familiarize themselves with more now than at any time in our nation's history. The principles and lessons given to us in those two books are the answer to much of the false doctrine that permeates modern churchianity today. I want to share a passage from Hebrews chapter 13 with you today. We're going to begin with verse 5. We might need to turn the heat up just a little bit. It's a little bit cool outside today. I want to start with verse 5. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. The word conversation does not mean speaking. It means manner of living. Let your manner of living be without covetousness. In Colossians chapter 3 and verse 5, covetousness is called idolatry. Covetousness is one of the great sins in America today, including within the church. And yet, according to the word of God, covetousness is idolatry. Anyone who is guilty of covetousness in their heart is guilty of idolatry in their heart. That's how seriously God looks at this sin. Let your conversation, your manner of living, be without covetousness. Be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Paul, remember, is writing to Hebrew believers. And here he quotes from the Old Testament. Much of the discussion in the book of Hebrews references Old Testament truth to illustrate the points that he is making under the new covenant. Here, this particular truth, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, he refers back to the Old Testament scripture. Deuteronomy chapter 31 and verse 6, Moses said, be strong and of a good courage. Fear not, nor be afraid of them. For the Lord thy God, he it is that doth go with thee, he will not fail thee nor forsake thee. Joshua said the same thing in essence in chapter 1 and verse 5. There shall not be any man able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee nor forsake thee. And then again in 1 Chronicles chapter 28 and verse 20. And David said to Solomon his son, Be strong and of a good courage. And do it, build the temple. And fear not, nor be dismayed. For the Lord God, even my God, will be with thee. He will not fail thee, nor forsake thee, until thou hast finished all the work for the service of the house of the Lord. So from the very beginning of the word of God and into the New Testament, we are told again and again and again, our God will never leave us or forsake us. In verse 6, oh, amen. 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 He will never leave us or forsake us. Verse 6, so that we may boldly say, 
The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. If God will never leave us, if he will never forsake us, we can boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. On the Ides of March of this year, I brought a message entitled, The Contagion of Fear. That was when the corona scare was just beginning. The Contagion of Fear. I ended that message singing to this congregation. I sang for you the wonderful hymn, God Will Take Care of You. Do you remember that? March 15, 2020. Be not dismayed, whate'er betide, God will take care of you. Beneath his wings of love abide, God will take care of you. Through days of toil when heart does fail, God will take care of you. When dangers fierce your path assail, God will take care of you. No matter what may be the test, God will take care of you. Lean weary one upon his breast, God will take care of you. In the chorus, God will take care of you through every day, all of the way. God will take care of you. He will take care of you. And now I'm telling you, in the middle of October, through some of the most difficult, challenging days in the history of our country, amidst the greatest assault against our Christian liberties and our civil rights since this country was born. God has taken care of us. And he will continue to take care of us. So why does the spirit of fear seem to control the church? Why? How can we be indwelled by the Spirit of God? How can we read the Word of God? I will never leave thee nor forsake thee and be filled with the spirit of fear. How is it possible? Fear has controlled the hearts of believers during every election cycle for the past 30 years, if not longer. Hardly ever does the church vote for a president. Instead, they vote against someone they don't want to be president. Their vote is predicated on fear. Pastors, TV and radio preachers, evangelists, scream, vote for the R party or it's the end of the world. That is the message that comes from the pulpits of this country every four years. The fear factor is what has motivated the Christian church in most of the endeavors relative to our civil liberties and our constitutional rights. It's all been predicated on fear. A couple of years ago, I brought a message 
a message that almost no one wants to watch. And at the end of this month, I'm going to take it down. It's called My Election Council. I prepared this message a couple of years ago in an election season. I took from the Word of God the principles upon which we should take into the voting booth. I shared with you the biblical principles and the constitutional principles that are required of us to take into the voting booth each and every time we cast a vote. And that it has been the failure to take those principles into the voting booth that has created the monstrous political malaise that we are currently in and have been in for three decades or more. People don't want to hear it. But there are biblical principles that should dictate the way we vote. We should vote according to biblical principles, not according to partisan politics. Nobody wants to hear that. This has probably been the least purchased video that I've ever put on the Liberty Fellowship store. People don't want to hear it. They've got their minds made up. It's all about party politics. It's all about keeping this party out and putting this party in. And then the infuriating thing to me is after they put the party they want in office, they do absolutely nothing to hold those men and women to the oath of office that they took to support, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States of America. The only time you hear them talk about the Constitution is when the other party violates it. But when their chosen party violates it, they don't care how much violation takes place. To let you know, since we are going to be voting here very soon, again, I have not voted personally for a presidential candidate since the primary election of 2012 when I voted for Ron Paul. Just letting you know. In 2016, I would have voted for Darrell Castle on the Constitution Party ticket had he been on the ballot here in Montana, but he wasn't. I have left the presidential ballot blank more often than I've checked it over the last 30 years. Before 2012, in the primary when I voted for Ron Paul, the last general election I voted in was for president was for G.W. Bush in 2000. Everything he said on the campaign trail was stuff that was true and stuff that I supported. And then as soon as he got elected, he forgot everything that he said on the campaign trail and he turned into just another establishment politician. So I could not vote for him for re-election in 2004. And in truth, our local and state elections are far more important than any presidential election. Far more important. Our county commissioners, our state legislators, our state senators, our governors, our attorney general, all these state offices, the, the congressman and the senator that go to Washington, more important. The president of the United States cannot 
do much of anything relative to domestic policy without the support of the Congress and the Senate and the governors and the state legislatures. It is the responsibility of local and state government to serve as a check and balance against anything that's going on in Washington, D.C. Therefore, the real power of America, the most important votes you will ever cast in your voting life are for the state and local offices for which you will vote. And I don't miss voting in those elections unless it's one that is obvious that I have no candidate in which to vote. And in this particular case, the primaries are so very important. Yeah. We should always be motivated by faith and not by fear. Yeah. And that means in the way we vote. We should vote in faith, not in fear. The Bible instructs us to faithfully follow Christ and his truth and to trust God to bless our faithfulness. That is what God expects us. Follow Christ and his truth faithfully. Trust God to honor our faithfulness. In other words, duty is ours, results are God's. Verse 7, remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. I'll just mention this briefly. The New Testament teaches that local church congregations are pastor-led, not board-run, not deacon-run, not committee-run, or denominational run. Any church that is run by a board or a deaconship or a trustee committee or committees of any kind or denominational hierarchy are not New Testament churches. New Testament churches have a man of God in the pulpit who leads that church under the headship of Christ. Amen. Remember them that have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God. In the church, the jurisdictional authority of the pastor is what is expressed in this verse. In fact, verse 17 says it again. Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves for they watch for your souls as they must give an account that they may do it with joy and not with grief for that is unprofitable for you. God is going to judge the pastor for how he leads his congregation and God is going to judge the congregation for how they follow their pastor. I'm going to stand before the Lord and give an account for my leadership in this fellowship. And each of you will stand and give an account for how you follow the leadership of this fellowship. That is what verse 17 is telling us. And then again in verse 24, he says the third time, salute all them that have the rule over you the pastors, and all the saints. So three times in this chapter, Paul gives to the pastor the divine authority of leading the congregation. And unfortunately, we have so many churches today that are led by committees and, and boards and denominations. They have no clue as to what a New Testament church really is and what a man of God is in that pulpit. In fact, they don't have men of God in the pulpits anymore. They have robots. The, the, I'm not joking. The pastors are the robots or the puppets 
And it's the deacons and the trustees and the committees that are pulling the strings of the pastor when he stands up and preaches on Sunday. That's not a man of God, and that's not a, a real New Testament church. In the first place, a real man of God would never allow any human being to be the string man making him do what they want him to do. The man of God speaks for God and he works for God independently as a man of God, not as the servant of men. Amen. And any man that would allow himself to be dictated to by a board or a committee is not a man of God. Amen. You wonder why these pastors are not saying anything. You wonder why they're going along with all this COVID nonsense. Why, why they are, are just sheepish. Well, you know, we talk about the 501c3, and that's a part of it. But the other part of it, the men are not God's men in the pulpit. They're the deacon's man. They're the trustee's man. They're the committee's man. They're controlled by a group of people in the church. And it, they're the ones who don't want the pastor to get up and take a stand on COVID. They're the ones who are for the masks. They're the ones who are for the lockdowns. They're the ones who don't want to jeopardize anything of their authority within the congregation. And they're pulling the strings of the man in the pulpit. That's why the pastors are not preaching out in their pulpits. You know, we just need, we need a total, almost, total and thorough house cleaning of everybody in Washington, D.C. and everybody in the pulpits of the churches of America. A clean house! Just... Verse 9, I'm going to skip over verse 8. I'll reserve that verse for another message. Verse 9, be not carried about with divers and strange doctrines, for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats, underline that, which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. Be not carried about with divers and strange doctrines. Boy, it's like this was written today. Because, buddy, our churches are filled with divers and strange doctrines. And then he gets specific. For it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace not with meats, meats referring to the old covenant law, the Judaic law regarding meats, which was manifold. The gospel is a gospel of grace. It's not a gospel of works. The gospel is a gospel of grace. It's not a gospel of meats and ceremonies and festivals and feast days and all these requirements under the law of Moses. Listen to 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 8. But meat commendeth us not to God. For neither if we eat are we the better, neither if we eat not are we the worse. According to the Old Testament law, it was very specifically stated the meats that could be eaten and that which must be avoided. The, not, the dietary laws were not only important in the average 
household among the children of Israel. It was very important to the observance of ceremonial law within the worship experience of the congregation. Very important and very specific. Now, Paul is saying that meats have nothing to do with the grace of God or the gospel. That meats are part of the strange doctrines that were permeating the church 2,000 years ago. And then in 1 Corinthians, meat commendeth us not to God. And if we eat, are we the better? If we don't eat, are we the worse? Completely opposite of everything that the Hebrews were taught under the Old Testament law. Go back a few chapters and look at this. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 8 through 10. We're coming back to chapter 13, but look at Hebrews chapter 9, verses 8 8 through 10. Very important passage. The Holy Ghost, this signifying, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing. Which, what, the tabernacle with all of its, the holy place, the holy of holies, everything about the worship experience, everything about the priestly duties inside the tabernacle, all of it, which was yet standing, which was a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks and divers' washings, baptisms, and carnal ordinances, imposed on them, look it, until the time of Reformation. The Reformation is the gospel of grace given us by the Lord Jesus Christ, the new covenant. Do you see that? Everything associated with tabernacle worship later temple worship. The only difference was the tabernacle was a tent. The temple was a real structure. But the same laws applied to both as far as the ceremonial laws were concerned. All of that, first of all, it didn't make anybody perfect. And the only thing it was was meats and drinks and divers washings and carnal, not spiritual ordinances, carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of the gospel. When the gospel came to mankind, the new covenant of grace through faith in the work of Jesus Christ. At that point, all of the washings and the ordinances and the meats and the drinks and the carnal ordinances were done. Totally, thoroughly finished. Now we are under the covenant of grace of which the Old Testament ordinances have no effect and purpose. Verse 10, he continues to explain, we have an altar. He's referring here, or he's he's contrasting, I should say, the altar of the Old Testament tabernacle and temple inside the holy place. They had an altar. He said, we have an altar. 
Whereof, all right, look, look very closely. They have no right to eat which serve the tabernacle. We have an altar. The Christian altar is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. He is both our altar and our sacrifice. Christ is our altar. He is our sacrifice. We have an altar, Christ. And they which continue to serve the tabernacle. They continue with the meats. They continue with the drinks. They continue with the carnal ordinances. They continue with the washings. They continue under the mosaic system of worship, under the old covenant law. They continue to serve the tabernacle, have no right to partake in the covenant of grace. In other words, they who serve and worship at the Jewish altar have no benefits of the altar of the Lord Jesus Christ. Say it another way. They who seek redemption and remission of sin at the altar of the works of the law have not Christ's grace and forgiveness. Do you understand that? Anybody who has placed themselves under the old covenant of works, who is worshiping according to the Mosaic system of worship, who is still serving the laws of the tabernacle and the temple, they have no standing at the altar of the Lord Jesus Christ which means they have no grace, no forgiveness, no salvation whatsoever. We are either saved by grace through faith in the work of Jesus Christ through his cross and resurrection, or we have no salvation at all. And these people who are trying to work themselves to salvation according to the old Jewish law are not part of the altar of the Lord Jesus Christ and have no grace and no forgiveness of sin. Think of the teeming millions of people in our churches every Sunday who are worshiping at the altar of works. They are as lost as a heathen in the remotest jungle on earth who's never even heard the name of Jesus Christ. Can Paul be any plainer? Those who are serving the tabernacle have no right to eat from the altar of the church, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. Verses 11 through 13. For the bodies of those beasts, those sacrificial animals, whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin on the Day of Atonement, are burned without the camp. Wherefore, Jesus also, our sacrifice, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate, 
after the animal's blood was shed and the high priest would take his blood, sprinkle it on the mercy seat inside the holy place. The carcass of the animal was taken outside the camp during the tabernacle days. They Remember, they were living in tents. They were roaming around, tearing down, setting up. They would take them outside the camp and burn the carcasses of the sacrificial animals. When the temple was constructed under Solomon, they would take the animals outside the gate of the city of Jerusalem to burn the animals. Jesus, our sacrifice, who shed his blood for us on the cross, was taken outside the city of Jerusalem and was sacrificed on Calvary. He's showing us He's, he's telling these Hebrew believers things that they would automatically understand very readily. They would compare the Old Testament sacrifices. And Paul is saying, now, this is our supreme sacrifice, the Lord Jesus. He's already told us in chapter 9 that the blood of bulls and calves could not redeem men from sin. But the blood of Jesus Christ redeems from sin. Now here he's saying, Jesus, our sacrifice, was taken outside the city of Jerusalem and sacrificed for us. Let us go forth, therefore, unto him, Christ. Where is he? Without the camp, outside the city, outside the gate. Let us go therefore unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. I hear a lot of these prosperity preachers and stuff talk about being like Christ, being like Christ, being like Christ. If you are like Christ, you are gladly bearing his reproach. Adam Clark writes this quick note about Jesus sacrificed outside the gate of Jerusalem. Well, no, I got ahead of myself. Here, here's the quote. The bodies of the sacrificial animals were burned outside the camp during the period of the tabernacle and outside the city of Jerusalem during the period of the temple. So too the blood of Jesus was sacrificed outside the gate of Jerusalem. Clark says, therefore, let us leave this city, Jerusalem, and system. Let us... Uh, Don't hang up on me yet. Because I'm getting to really the, the focus of this message. Let us leave this city and system devoted to destruction and take refuge in Jesus alone, bearing his reproach, being willing to be accounted the refuse of all things and the worst of men for Jesus' sake. Adam Clark. I'm going to come back to that in a moment. Outside the camp, notice it's not only the city. It means also outside the worldly, beastly system. Amen. Jerusalem was more than a city. 
It was a system. Outside the camp means outside the system. It means outside the establishment. When it talks about bearing his reproach, think about it. Jesus and his disciples were reproached by the Romans, by the Greeks, and by the Jewish systems. The Roman system crucified Christ. The Jewish system crucified Christ and killed the apostles. The Greek system likewise persecuted the apostles and the church. The great systems of first century, of the first century world, the Roman system, the Greek system, the Jewish system, all reproached Christ and his disciples. The application and the appeal to us by Paul, who I believe is the author of this book, is saying we too must follow Christ outside the camp, outside the systems of the beastly world in which we live and accept the reproach of Christ, being willing to be considered odd, being willing, willing to be persecuted, being willing to be despised, being willing to be hated because we will not submit to the Antichrist beastly system. Amen. I preached a message some time ago called, uh, I don't see it, Inside the Fold and Outside the Mold. It's on the store and it's on the table over there. Inside the fold and outside the mold. I preached that a couple of years ago. It's a message that gets looked over by most people. I wish you would get that message and watch it. I delve into this very topic at length. I talk about how that we, if we are truly following Christ, are going to be outside the systems of the world. And I go through church history and I talk about the Protestant Reformation. I talk about the early church. I talk about our founding fathers and the colonial church in our country and how that the one consistency between these groups of believers throughout the 2000 years of church history is that all of them were willing to stand bravely and courageously outside the beastly system in which they lived. And that is the appeal that Paul is making to us right here. Follow Christ outside the camp, taking his reproach. Verse 14. Now it gets really interesting. For here we have no continuing city but we seek one to come. Whoa. What city is he talking about? Jerusalem. Jerusalem is not only called by the children of Israel the holy city. It was also called the eternal city. And you will hear that phrase applied to the current Roman city of Jerusalem. You understand that the city of Jerusalem existing today was not a Jewish city. It was rebuilt after its destruction by Hadrian 
in 136 AD as a Roman outpost. The wall that's called the Western Wall or the Wailing Wall that you see all these pictures of people bowing down and putting little notes in the cracks and all that kind of stuff. And they say this was part of the original wall of Jerusalem are either lying or they are totally deceived. It was not the wall of the original city of Jerusalem because we were told, and if you watch my message on the destruction of Jerusalem, you know that the walls of Jerusalem were completely leveled to the ground, so much so that the historians said, after seeing the destruction of the city of Jerusalem, that it looked like no city ever existed on that spot. No, it was, it was part of the rebuilt city, of the rebuilt fort of the Roman outpost that they're calling the Western Wall. They don't even have the right wall. I mean, forget about the right doctrine. They don't even have the right wall. For here we have no continuing city. Listen to Clark. Here is an elegant and forcible allusion to the approaching destruction of Jerusalem. Do you see how many times the New Testament scripture references the coming destruction of Jerusalem? over and over and over again. Here we have no continuing city. An elegant allusion to the approaching destruction of Jerusalem. The Jerusalem that was below was about to be burnt with fire and erased to the ground. The Jerusalem that was from above was that along which could be considered to be permanent. The word seems to say, arise and depart, for this is not your rest, it is polluted. He's telling the Hebrew Christians in Jerusalem. This city is not going to exist much longer. Get out. Do you remember the message, the destruction of Jerusalem? It's in our second package of the Israel packages. Second package, but you can buy it separately if you'd like. I talked about the oracles of God who warned the believers in Jerusalem to escape before the Roman army arrived. And that by the time Titus leveled Jerusalem to the ground, there was not a single Christian in it. All of the believers, of which there were tens of thousands, that were in the city of Jerusalem before the siege left and escaped the horrors of that assault. And here is the Apostle Paul telling the inhabitants, the Hebrew inhabitants, and for that matter, if there was non-Hebrews there, which there might have been a few, of the city of Jerusalem, this city is not going to continue. Get out. About seven or eight years after this book was written, Jerusalem was wholly destroyed. The eternal city of Jerusalem was not 
the city that was built by David. It was not the Old Testament city of Jerusalem. That city was totally destroyed in 70 AD. The eternal city of Jerusalem is the heavenly city of Jerusalem. As far back as the life of Abraham, Hebrews 11, 8 through 10. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should have to receive for an inheritance, obeyed. For he went out, not knowing whether he went. Sounds like some of us, huh? By faith, he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. He wasn't looking for a human city. He was looking for a heavenly city. A city not made by the hands of men, but by God himself. I'm almost done. Turn to Galatians chapter 4. I want to show you one passage. So important. Galatians chapter 4, verses 21 through 26, and then verse 31. Paul said, Tell me, ye that desire to be under the law, the law of Moses. Do ye not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh. But he is of the free woman, was by promise. Which things are an allegory? For these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, the Mosaic covenant, which gendereth to bondage, which is Agar. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is, at that time, Jerusalem still existed, and is in bondage with her children. That Jerusalem that existed before 70 AD represents bondage. It represents death. It represents judgment. It represents the Old Testament law which put us into bondage and pronounced death upon all of us. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. So then, brethren, verse 31, we are not children of the bondwoman of the old Jerusalem, but we are children of the free, of the new Jerusalem. The only Jerusalem of which the child of God in this age of grace and the new covenant of Christ, the only Jerusalem that has any bearing 
of any kind upon us as believers in Christ is the new Jerusalem. Revelation 21.2 And I, John, saw the holy city. You hear people talk about the city over there today, the Roman city, as holy city. No. John said, I saw the holy city, new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. That is the Christian's Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem. All of this infatuation with that Roman rebuilt city of Jerusalem, all of the infatuation with that UN created state of Israel in 1948, or should I say Rothschild created state of Israel in 1948, is totally, thoroughly, and completely misplaced. That city means nothing to a child of God today. It symbolizes nothing except to say that it is being used by the evil one as a faux Israel to deceive Christians into a false doctrine to bring the Christian church back under the law of Moses from which Christ has set us free. Therefore, we are told, go forward. I like that. We're not going back. I'm not going back into the bondage that I came out of. I have no interest in going back to the laws of Moses that, from which Christ has set us free. We're in a new covenant. We're, we live in the wonderful age of grace where Christ's blood shed on Calvary's cross has cleansed us from all sin. That we are saved by grace through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. And I refuse to allow myself to be subjected to the doctrine of works, salvation, ever Amen. again. Amen. Never will I submit to the doctrine of works. Go forward outside the camp outside the beastly system are you getting this go forward outside the camp bearing the reproach of Christ and fearing not that is the charge that we are given in this passage. Go forward. Outside the camp. Bearing the reproach of Christ. And being glad to do it. And fearing nothing. Would not this single truth free the churches in America and in Great Britain and in Australia and in Canada? Would not this one simple truth free the churches of the Western world today? Would it not reclaim the principles of Liberty given to us by our Creator first and then by our Redeemer second. 
reinstating the courageous, bold preaching of the pulpits and reigniting the courageous convictions of the people in the pews of the churches to rise as one giant force for God and take back that which has been lost under the cowardice and the fear of the church over the last how many decades? If you're on board with this, you got a home at Liberty Fellowship. If you're not on board with this, Liberty Fellowship is not for you. We are going forward. We are going outside the camp. We are going to bear the reproach of Christ gladly, and we're going to do it without fear. That is what we will do. Let's stand for a word of prayer.